See, I picked up the newspaper today and noticed the heading read that Otis Redding was dead. But I too have dreams to remember. I spent seven years in Tibet on a nail bed eating stale bread. Seven years worth of regret and I talk loud and I walk proud. See, I was born in 1979 with no past and a tall glass of heavenly wine. To pass the time, I would learn to rap and rhyme. Along the way, I met handfuls of angels, dogs and swine, strangers, killers and moms. At the age of 11, I would draw pictures of Christ with a Mac 11. I made friends with the trees and closed my eyes to absorb the breeze. Now another boat floats with sails broken. Another tale of the unspoken. Another Hail Mary barely reaches the end zone. Another foe pretends to be a friend, so what? So if I stood you up, my apology. But as soon as I stood up, my shadow followed me. Out of my door, into my car, out of this world, into the stars. So after seven years of wasting time, I realized that stale bread that I once tasted, tasted fine. In those seven years worth of regret that once hurt my chest, no one will weigh me down. Cause now not even a game of chess with death could lay this king down. Now is my time. Now that my mind is clear. Now we can all find why in this world we are here. It's all good. I, I remember old school like it was yesterday. I was walking with my Walkman. Let me explain, 98 I got the keyboard and 8 track Before that it was the boombox or playback I lost a lot of sleep, dream of staying up at night If that makes sense, why put up a fight? I was tech to a strange RZA to the Wu-Tang All my friends rap, time to do the crew thing Spent most of my time on the east side Jacket instrumentals from west coast B-side Throw a house party, freestyling for the camera Damn, we even took a trip down to Atlanta uh, You ever had a friend that you forgot about? The type that post bail and got you out Ouch, damn it hurts, don't it? The type of homie that was always there in the worst moments Catalog been stacked up, Frank Tan Live Terabyte, you came back up, basement up All the work that we've been putting in the menu And the bubble that they put us in Trucks to pull Started labeling, we set a trend Dub tape, break my back just for dividends Simple cast, play the track and do it all again Hustle the fuck Look at that, baby, really good from the pen But the least you can do is break with the better than the friends I stand like I had to bury a twin when I carry a pen it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. Everybody has some kind of dream. So what does it mean to pursue your dream? What's it like to, to love something so much that you can't not do it? You know, people ask me sometimes, how'd you get started or how do I get started? You know, how do they get started? How do you go about it? kind of laugh and I'm just like the first thing you got to do is become absolutely obsessed with it. I fell in love with rap music um, in my early teens you know listening to it just the whole concept of it how it just just I mean of course that was the MTV generation I did fall in love with the imagery of it and just the energy of it. You know, I, it was like when I was 15 or 16, I started finding certain artists and product and people that I liked, and I started mimicking their rhymes and taking their instrumentals off B-side tapes. You know, the singles would have B-side instrumentals, and I would rap to them on a karaoke machine and um, start write, writing my own rhymes and freestyling. Uh, growing up, you know, my dad was a, I, was, I wasn't around him, but he was sort of an urban legend guitar player around town, so music was definitely laying dormant way in my blood as far as just a love for it and eventually crafting my own and making it. Um, but I picked up being more of a, a lyricist and a, and a writer and a wordsmith a little more so than like my dad did. He was more of a, but I picked up his obsession. You know, he was obsessed with the guitar. You know, he'd lock himself in the bathroom for hours just to get one note right. You know, he was completely obsessed with it. He was more about sitting down and mastering one skill, you know. So maybe I took a little bit of that determination and mixed it in with, you know, unknowingly with my own passions. 
my mom was a music lover you know she she sang she introduced i was raised mostly by her so she was constantly around her singing and introducing me to all this different music his ability for it i'm sure came from his father like, you know genetically because chris has just taken to it you know just like it was he was born with it you know he he said i'm going to get a piano and you know a little while later he was just playing the piano like nobody's business and same thing with the guitar and you know just you know it's mostly the words you know everything goes back to the words and his lyrics but um but when he started putting music to it then they really took off and then you know growing up with all my childhood friends and all my homies from over the years, everybody was just into rap music. My mic, that's like the afterlife, being it too early, like Marshall Applewhite, so we all know the UFO, silver surfing your brainwaves. And so it was kind of like we just got abducted by the hip hop culture and influenced, you know, and I'm, and I'm thankful for that. Growing up, um, I was actually painfully shy. I was kind of uh, fearful of a lot of things. I'd had a really unpredictable inconsistent childhood growing up. I moved around a lot. Well, first we moved to Mobile, Alabama for about a, about almost a year. And then I, we came back to Kentucky and then I was like, okay, let's move to, let's move to Chicago. It was kind of a little sporadic and um, nomadic in a way. I wasn't outgoing. I wasn't very confident. I wasn't a great student. You know, I couldn't keep um, focused on the criteria that they wanted. I slowly became a class clown, goofing off, writing raps in the back of the hallway, more worried about what girl I was trying to talk to. I was surrounded by a lot of cool people and built my confidence, helped me get social. There was definitely a transformation from being shy and timid and essentially, you know, the kid that was being bullied or, or being overlooked or bumped in the hallway and turned down by girls and all that to having a smile on my face and getting through school and being motivated on the years following and picking up hobbies and passions and uh, cre you know creativity which eventually kept me out of trouble and changed my life in the next few years no matter where I was going with the music and that side of my life was progressing it never got to the point where I was paying my bills. I had so many jobs. I've, I've been a grounds worker and done manual labor. And from the mowing, the weeding, the painting, the remodeling, the tree work, you know, doing whatever, fast food, uh, factory work. Um, I've worked everywhere. It's more like I can just ride around anywhere in this town and be like, yep, I worked there. And I tried that for a little while. And yeah, I worked there for a few years, you know. That job doesn't work out, and then I'm, I'm trying a new career path, and I'm constantly chasing that check and uh, building my skill set and, and doing all this like everyday community stuff, you know. Uh, but every night and every day and every moment I'm riding, I'm kind of disconnected from that, and I'm writing and I'm expressing. I'm thinking about my next batch of songs or how I'm going to promote this this new album. You, you never know what to expect on his next album because it's always so different. And that's awesome. You know, it's, to be versatile like that is not very common. He always takes it in a surprising direction. You know, it's never the predictable way that you think the music's going to go. It always, it always zigs when it should have zagged. He's not just a rapper, though. You know, like I said, he sings, too. Like, I know one album, it just... It has such a jazzy feel to it, and though know, he just told me, just came out with like a country album, you know. So hybrid, the rapper should be hybrid, the artist. To me, he can't fit them in a box. at a, 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 a talent show right and in this talent show you could do like you could do poetry you could sing you could rap you know what i'm saying you know and um you know it was a historically black college so most of the most of the people in there were black all the artists that were performing they were all black 
So I remember him going up there and I remember saying to myself, like, what this white boy going to do? You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm like saying to myself in my head, right? Man, this boy got up there and fucking bodied all of us. He did some type of poetry piece and the shit was so ill. His delivery and his flow was so crazy that I'm sitting there like, like he, he shut that shit down and everybody was going crazy. Like, so, you know, I had to go up to him, give him his props. Like, yo, good shit, bro. You know, you did your thing or whatever. Tell me a little bit about the background of the name Hybrid the Rapper. Well, where, where'd that come from? Well, you see back in the, the biblical times, um, uh, the fallen angels made it with, uh, human women and created a hybrid. No, I'm just playing. I'm not even going to get, I'm not going to do that one. Uh, basically, um, a hybrid, how I see it is, you know, pretty much all humans are, you know, we half, half flesh, half spirit. We're mixed between that. Um, we're half good, half bad. You know, we, we have these two sides and these two things, whether you're speaking literally with your true life and your actually DNA and what makes you into the person you are. Um, I kind of I wanted to have that because that was just the one thing you can't run from is the fact that we are combinations and mixtures of of different things and different emotions. But it's kind of gradually just become like I like to do all kinds of different styles. I love all sorts of uh, different music. I like to sing. I like to do the spoken word. I like to play with my vo voice to where I have just different deliveries. And I'm just this overall concoction of all these different influences that I've had in these different ways that I want to be perceived as or whatnot. So basically hybrid is in a blend. Locally, they can't cope with me because vocally I'm what they hope to be. Now, if you know my name, then choke the gate. Because every other day I'm going to blow your brain. I'm hot like Arizona. Lime in my corona. Man, your plans over expanding to landowner. Not handing them grands over my fam in a land rover. Stand it with my soldiers. Your clan gets ran over. Hands over fists. Plans to be rich. Sand and tan chicks. She fans the man. It's it. I really can't think of too many MCs that's tighter than me. Because I've been living at the top. Where they fighting to be And I'm like a fight in the sea So bury me with my sword And when I'm done with this earth Carry me to the Lord Hey, hey. One of the main turning points in my life was um, In the late 90s My senior year in high school uh, Towards the end of the school year Which was May uh, Me and some of my friends We had went to Lexington Around that time In 97 We were coming back from Lexington And I had a major a uh, life-threatening car wreck. Um, it's pouring down rain in the middle of a thunderstorm. We started a hydroplane on and off through this area. Right where it dips here, it held a whole lot of water here. So when we hit it, we hit it about right here and just kept hydroplaning, hydroplaning. About where this truck is right here, I merged over and we hit head on going about this speed right here. Bam. So I kind of stumbled out of the car and you couldn't see much other than the lights from uh, from the two cars. But for the most part, everybody was okay. And I thought I was okay. I remember they asked me, they asked me if I smoked because they noticed a spot on my lung. So I had a punctured lung. So that night I immediately went from x-rays to get an emergency surgery because if I had went home when everybody else did, I probably would have died in my sleep. I only had one lung working. They basically inserted a tube into my lung and I spent three days in the hospital. And it actually turned into a, an awakening of sorts for me. Maybe he wanted to do this with his life, but at that moment he knew he had to because that's really, really what he wanted. You know, that was what was going to make him happy. So that was probably his epiphany moment, you know, for him. Something woke up inside of me that was laying dormant, something, some sort of inspiration, and some sort of connection and creative force that just started flowing out, and that's when I really started to write. my prized possession. Uh, not many people have even seen it, um, but it, it's basically a huge, massive collection of writing. Uh, 
uh, from over the years. I would say this goes back to when I was about 15 or 16 years old. All the different places I've lived, I would have a certain book um, or a so, certain folder or um, you know, a certain notepad. I love this because of these long pages. This was actually an old, old tax book. So I would fill them up and they would bleed through to the other side. There's a lot in this one. <laughs> you can see the extent. These are probably raps that were used. Compare what's unfair, double dare, rarely dare, fairly aware, fairly scared, barely shared, barely unprepared, staring, glares. I was just playing with rhymes, you know, just whatever. This was a um, this was a novel idea. That's what this is. This is where I started to write a novel. You know, a lot more sketches in here than I thought. I had issues. I, here's this cool picture I found uh, at this old abandoned house out in Nineveh. I always liked it. It was abandoned on the wall, so I took it. Just take a 35 millimeter picture and throw it on an album cover. No filters or the hand draw. Yeah, all these we just, that's the only way we had to really do it. We didn't really have software for album covers, so we just made them. <laughs> these are all poems and stuff. The computers even play these anymore. <laughs> I guess that's what I why I grabbed onto rap so heavy is because rap was a way that I could finally translate all this energy and all this work into something tangible for people to enjoy and share. And I became an MC. You know, all those dreams of wanting to publish poetry books and perform it at coffee shops and all that, it, it kind of uh, morphed into, wow, I can actually do this and I can do it over top of beats and music and people can share in it. You know, he's tried everything with his music. He's done like, you know, I said he started with writing and then he went to spoken word and then he, he had a group, his first group, Basement Upstairs, you know, they, they did great, you know, here. They did a lot of things in Frankfurt. I think the Basement Up was kind of like a, the, the involvement of this kind of crew of friends that we had. Um, there were some albums they did when I was deployed at the time that I really wasn't on much and then but it was all love like you know what up come home and you know like hey welcome home let's do these tracks we can you know put you back on the on a beat and stuff and you know we do that and, you know it was it was the highlight of our week we'd get in the studio listen to a beat write the song record the song all on the same night you know it wasn't as organized as, as it is today where you email a buddy a beat and he writes a verse to it and then they record it in two three different spots and man back then you know we would get together we'd be in a room together and be, we'd come up with a concept or an idea and we would just there we go everybody be over there quietly writing 20 30 minutes later an hour or two later we'd all have a song picture picture a room not not a big room at all probably no place to sit about 10 people inside that room pencils and pads you know, say waiting for that time to record. Yeah. You know, just like, all right, you next. Chris is running over there, yeah. like, okay, you up next, Booney. I'm like, I'm ready. Take two, you know, take three. It's, I, I mean, always think about that. There's the hunger. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about that because there's no other art form on the planet where you get grown men in a room that are taking turns writing, basically, essentially poetry, that are waiting their return, their turn to get on that mic and have their opportunity. You know, so you'd have, like you said, a room full of people in a circle, and all you hear was, <laughs> <laughs> yep. We started performing, I guess, maybe around 2001, 2002. It was one of our first shows. I played drums for a for a hardcore band uh, that was out of this small little town, and we used to throw these shows uh, in our hometown. And the only way that they would rent this building was they didn't they wouldn't rent it for anything less than four hours. So we were 
you know, a band who maybe had an hour set, so we would always book these openers. And we wanted to bring a little bit of variety to the show. Uh, so I started asking around to uh, some friends of mine who were musicians as well. I contacted him uh, through our mutual friend and, and I booked him and it turns out it was his, he didn't tell me at the time, uh, but it was his very first live performance. And he went up and, and uh, him and uh, Basement Upstairs, I think they did a 25 minute set. It was unorganized, it was sloppy. We just thought we were the shit. We were gonna get up there and just, we, hey, we got our verses memorized, so we're gonna do this. But we didn't understand the, the, um, I, I guess the, the, the unison you have to have as a group in order to make it a good show. Because when you got four or five voices up there performing at the same time, and, and, and you're not prepared, and you're not organized, and it kind of comes off like everybody's just yelling stuff. <laughs> And then eventually, man, I think we found our uh, we found our our groove around 2005. Man, I go back and look at some shows, and I was like, man, like we've been doing kind of the same material for about a year, and it and it, and it really started to click, and it really started to work. And I think what happened was, I think we got so comfortable with what we were doing and we were so content with what we had as a group that I think that I think that was too slow of a pace for Chris. He was really wanting to do other stuff, and I think it confused us, like where are your priorities? So there was one point where we kind of had a falling out, like, look, we're doing this and you're doing this other stuff. And I think all of us being young, man, I think we all kind of took it a little too personally. Um, when we all knew Chris and we knew like this is just what he does. Chris makes music. Chris is whether he's doing spoken word, poetry, rapping, singing, making beats, recording, promoting, whatever. He's just he's got to be doing something. I think that just it just came to a head at one point with the group to where it was like, OK, you need to go spread your wings doing what you do and we're going to go do this. And I think eventually we, we all were kind of like, yeah, that was probably best for everybody. So, downstairs, you had a rock band that jammed twice a week, and upstairs, I had the hip-hop studio. And through the band, Velvet X, who was playing here, we started getting our first opportunities to go out in town and perform. You know, I, we would have parties, and we would play and perform music at the parties, and we would practice here, and the band was practicing here, and there was always music being made and music being heard, and this house just became a creative, you know, uh, conduit. I don't know, something about just being out here, out in the country and, you know, the quiet of night and the, the creativity was just, um, it multiplied. It seems like a whole life ago. It was like I was tapping into some sort of dormant inner <laughs> poet. Like I said, I, ne I never ran out. I, I could just fill up page after page after page. I was like, I didn't even know when to start and when to end. It was just constant the whole time I was here. I don't know if a, if a certain setting can do that to somebody or a certain house or if it's the time in your life, but it definitely did it to me. But I think he's got a lot, you know, of, of just stuff that he needs to tell the world about himself and his life and you know, he's got stories, and, and I think that, that that probably makes the best music, really, you know, is because when you tell a story, um, and it's not just like this general music nowadays where it's like about trapping and selling drugs and, you know, and women and, you know, uh, degradation and all of that, it's actually like something people can relate to. Chris has a lot of that. 
The reason why therapy works is because you just talk about it. And I think for artists, that that's our therapy. Like that is our, we're just putting it all out there. You know, like a lot of people don't understand, like with musicians, I think we're probably the most troubled people. I think we're the probably most disturbed people sometimes because we take, we internalize everything because we need, it's our content. You know, and all that, all that encompasses who we are as artists. Well, Hybrid's been through plenty of stuff that's just like, you know, that, that would probably require therapy for some people, but it's like he, he didn't necessarily have to do that because he had music. He had other people saying, yes, I've gone through that too. I met my son's mother at a really young age. We were both really, really young, and we had met, and uh, she was from a different city. She was actually from California, but had moved to Kentucky um, at a young age. And when I met her, you know, she was just a sweet, innocent girl, you know, and I was just kind of a wild teen. Um, and I was so young, and I, did, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was just... I was just going with the flow, you know, I was head over heels for uh, and I was working for the state and trying to do right, I was trying to do the music, I was trying to be a father, trying to be a um, fiance, you know, trying to be a man, but really I still had a lot of issues myself, we fought a lot, she started going back to them same old devils. You know, some of dealing with her own demons, psychologically, emotionally, chemically. Um, we had a messy breakup. Um, and as we split apart, you know, I basically got knocked down back to just starting all over. And at that point, I, could, I had no control anymore. We had broke up, I moved off, moved away. My focus and my energy became focused on, okay, I need to get my son. You know, I need, I need to get custody or I need to just set up a life for him that revolves doesn't revolve around the family unit anymore because it broke apart. So then I, I became in survival mode and, and protector mode. And as she was slipping farther and farther, I was working harder and harder to, to get my money right, to get, a, to get my house right, to get custody, to get things situated because she was losing it and I didn't want him to be drug into that life, that unpredictable, inconsistent lifestyle. Not too many people can relate to the story I tell. Most times it's the father that is fucking up, but in this case, that would be boring as hell. Had the cross on the cross like a savior. I was Las Vegas, in and out of anger management, making payments, damn it. But I'm saved with play. And I was ready to go to war and ready for a court case. Do you call me up and said you couldn't make it anymore? You ruined on the floor. What you doing's like a whore, what for? I walked down the middle of the street on the darkest night My castle collapsed, my heart wasn't right I was dropped in a crazy world, Lord knows I love that baby girl I'm a react, pissed like a cheap jab, in and out of rehab Cut like a deep stab, for second and break up my son's will I thought of you as a queen, how you ever gonna do that? They say everything happens for me, son I'd love to know why I'd love to know why I'd love to know why I feel like my whole generation was fatherless. There was something about the, the wild 70s and free love that just left a lot of us 80s babies and 90s babies without parents, <laughs> without dads especially. Um, and there could be a lot of social, economical, philosophical reasons behind that. I don't know. But I, I know most of my friends growing up in this little old small town in Kentucky did not have dads. A few of them, there was always exceptions to the rule, and a few of them had cool stepdads or supportive stepdads. But a lot of the guys I know, they, they didn't. And they turned to other things for fatherly figures and mentors. How you fix an engine? How you play ball? How you stand up for yourself in a ball? How you treat a woman with a start, with an end? No answer from him, so I turned to my friends. So many lonely nights and the pain that came with it. Wondering where I went wrong and if my mother did it. Now your grandson's handsome at 13 and the shit we been through is like the worst dream. Forsaken by my own father, God tell me why. Down there living a good life, but you couldn't say hi. Couldn't stop by. Pops, why did you claim my brother? Ironic, I'm a single dad and my son got no mother. You didn't want to tell me stories as a little boy. Now we trade war stories in a life of little joy. I know you had to leave town to make your life better. But 
but it only takes five minutes to write letters Sometimes blood runs dry And the ones that we love get swallowed Then later on it's like we barely know them at all Usually when I'm down in the dumps, I just play this beat. It just does something, I don't know, it just makes everything better. Right? Uh. Maybe we can go to Calabar. Ooh, alright. Take a year, try some chats and words. Nah, let's do this. Check. Train like when she walked in the club. Not a type, she don't talk to the thugs She reads books, but no jeep on her man With good looks and a rosary up in her hand She kinda old school, likes to laugh a lot One glance when she dance, gonna have like an astronaut Pretty eyes, fitting sighs, long flowing hair And when I find out where she is, I'm going there Cause, Cause I'm a golden ager, like I'm like, you know Yo MTV Raps, you know, coming up with that kind of stuff And like, hip hop then was like Sometimes they'd be really serious and sometimes they'd be really goofy and sometimes it'd be like a goofy song with a serious message or uh, it sounds serious but it's not really that deep and it's just like it allowed to have that variety in it and I think people nowadays are way too serious man way too serious like just like so the hoodie song I think part of the reason why that was such a, a big hit for him was like people are like yes I can finally laugh at, I can finally laugh at hip-hop videos again you know it was total comedy and I, I literally got on social media and I posted the idea, just a simplistic idea about, um, you know, when a, when a breakup goes sour, the, the female sort of inherits the hoodie. We broke up and you stole my clothes, that could be a blues song basically, but basically he turned it into a comedy and the, the video is a comedy. You was, but you wasn't. Now you're probably like my cousin. What? That sucks. Bad luck. Guess I crossed a black cat, but that's what I get for dating girls on Snapchat. Oh, no. That's that. It was fun while it lasted. I ain't sweating you. I'm moving on. I got past it. But honestly, my closet ain't never been no good at bad. I thought about it long and hard. I really need that hoodie back. And I know we ain't together, but for real, we ain't gotta be. But the first freaking hoodie that you wear is my property. Now, why you playing? And so I let the fans make that song, in a sense. I let the supporters kind of determine um, the outcome of that one. And in turn, they, they responded and they supported it. And I suddenly became the spokesperson for bitter men <laughs> who lost hoodies along the way through breakups. But look, hey, yo, I'm going to need that hoodie back, though. We met at, at, in the Kroger Deli, really didn't know each other, but you know, we kind of had a, we had this connection. So one day he just brought a tape, he had his music on there and I took it home and I listened to it and I was like, wow, he's really talented. So I brought it back and I'm like, dude, what have you been doing? Why are you sitting in your basement? Why you need to be doing something? So he invited me over, man, and it, it was really cool. I went over, we went downstairs, and I mean, right then and there, laid the track, did the vocals, song was done. I mean, immediate chemistry. It was amazing. So that, that started kind of everything. I remember us going back to work the next day and just, you know, just like, wow, can't believe this. All happened. We started writing lyrics on the cookie boxes in the freezer. And then the only thing we had to do was come up with music. When you back up here with all the opportunities comes I wanna spend my life with you. 
just sings like blue in the radio Offering nines, ten, so each turn of the yard She's a dance and a chick without nothing to do Peace signs and flowers when she walks in the room and then once we started, and we kind of started in the studio making our own music and then letting our friends close around here. And then next thing you know, we formed a band because a lot of a lot of those tracks that we did, we we didn't have drums. We found a drummer. He could play the beats. We had somebody who could play the melody. I would hold the rhythm, and there you go. We had it was and it was unique. It was kind of like hip hop, but with like a like soul. Imagine what what you would listen to today, as far as hip hop rock, country, you name it. Imagine all that wrapped up into one song. We played around town, we played everywhere. I remember for a while it was like, because we were still wanting to write songs, it was times we were really wanting to practice and write more songs got so busy we couldn't even write new songs so we I mean it really really took off I remember we played probably three four times a week so when you combine all that with what's going on with Kentucky you're going to get something explosive the problem was is with here in this community he didn't there wasn't the support that you needed for it to, to grow so We both started working at the same job downtown here in Frankfurt. We were uh, grounds maintenance landscape slash landscape. You know, we rode around together in a state truck half the time, and Chris always had a pad of paper and a pencil and it was jotting down ideas. And you know, I said, what are you writing down over there? You know, he'd tell me his ideas of wanting to maybe one day be a rapper and. and and you know, then I told him, well, you know, I do country music at the time. That's all I really was doing. We we started hanging out a little more, and, and the idea was just, hey, you know, you can sing, I rap. Let's let's try to maybe start a band or at least do something together. And that's where Embercast came about. We thought that it would hit a lot of people that from different, you know, ways of life, country folk, people who live in the city and, and you know, kind of throw them all in a room and that they'd all have a good time with it. But m most people around here just want to hear one certain type of music or look it up, walk out. They come in and, well, they ain't playing no country tonight. Well, they ain't playing no rock. They don't want to give things a chance around here. Uh, for a good year or so of that, though, we, we was pretty good. We were out about every Friday, Saturday night. It's like trying to box with rocket nuts. And 
as a band, it's tough. Not everybody can get together on dates and times and scheduling. It's hard to find time to do what I want to with music or I'd probably still be dedicated like Chris is. Chris is very dedicated and not taking anything away from him. I know he has a kid too and it, it must be hard doing everything that he does and still having time to be with family. But some people were born for it and they were, they were born with a piece of paper and a pen in their hand and you know some people figure it out as they go. I think Chris was born with a pad of paper and a pen and saying that. I think I met him that way. I got with Chad Hupp, who was a childhood friend of mine, and uh, he had been doing music and doing more of the, the metal music in his past, but uh, I knew that he rapped, and then of course I was doing the bass upstairs and, you know, in more of a rap group, and we got together and we were like, we should collaborate, you know, for old time's sake, just on general principle. And eventually, you know, we kept making a few more songs, we were like, man, this would be badass if we got with some live musicians and turned it into a full-blown band. And so he had, a, he had a handful of musicians who he was more friends with at the time, who he had worked with um, in the past. We just brought the instruments and the band together. It was like, we presented him the album, we gave him the album. It was like, here, this is what we want to do. We, we want more energy, we want, you know, we want a live. And they just took off with it. I mean, they, they would nail the, you know, the riffs and the beat, but they would bring, you know, they bring a metal feel to it. And the band itself, you know, they were all highly influenced by groups like Korn and Tool and a lot of real edgy um, new uh, metal and rock music. And me personally, I, I wasn't that familiar with it. I was just more of a rapper who could sing. And so we started jamming in this dark, cold, musty basement um, on the east side of Frankfurt. And it really came together. Their influences just fit like a glove when it came to the way me and, me and Hup fed off each other. And so Juxtapose was created. It was emotional, it was raw, it was pissed off, uh, but it was also skillful. And um, it had a real primal energy to it. And me and Hup just double ad-libbed each other. There was never a dull moment. When I was rapping, he was screaming. When he was screaming, I was singing. We saw it as if it was kind of like the good and the bad angel on, her, on your shoulder. You know, I represented the light, he represented the dark, and the yin and the yang, or the good and the bad, or the passive and aggressive. Um, and so our songs were written with this internal turmoil going on. It was something about the live show with the band and the intensity of it. It just, people just grabbed a hold of it and they loved it. Um, but in turn, when you deal with that type of high energy emotional music, it sort of invites a lot of dark clouds into your life. And that was our problem. Um, some of the members of the group were rubbing off on other members and it was just, uh, it was a bad mix. And there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of turmoil and there was a lot of, I, I would say darkness, honestly. And in, in, in the end, it seems like the darkness kind of took over that group. It was, a, it was an awesome time, but it was a dark, frustrating time too, because people carried with them a lot of burdens and a lot of problems and issues. We kind of, as a band, went separate ways. And that was, there wasn't, there wasn't much we could do as far as recording wise. I didn't have a setup to record a band at that time. And we didn't really have Nobody ever had, it seemed like nobody ever had money to go pitch in on the studio. Everybody had money for drugs and alcohol, <laughs> but not studio time. Uh, we just couldn't hold on, you know, and, and I hate to see it because it was so much talent and such an original sound. And me and Hup tried to um, keep it going, 
and it, it changed forms. You know, we were still juxtaposed as as a duet, but it wasn't the, quite the same juxtaposed as when we had a, uh, a full band. So many memories, I gotta keep them with me. Had some people with me, chiefing with me, now they beefing with me. I made some friendships, gained some kinship. The pain that seems endless, but seems to end quick. I just want a little unity and bring some flavor to our community. Never meant to turn you to an enemy. Now I regenerate our energy. The catalog been stacked up, Frank Tan Live. Terabyte, you came back up. Listen up, all the work that we've been putting in. And then you, and the bubble that they put us in. Trucks to blow. Started labeling, we set a trend. Dub tape, break my back just for dividends. Ever cast, play the track and do it all again. Hustle and flow. Even though this is a small town, there's a lot of talent here. And there's a lot of people who need to be heard. And a lot of unique voices. So that's what dub tape was. Dub tape was always meant to be a collective consciousness of artists and MCs. They were essentially just my friends. And then people that I met along the way through promotion and networking that I could bring along and be like, hey, I like your music. I want to help put you out. I want to do shows with you. I want to make songs with you. And I always had this kind of uh, come one, come all type of uh, camaraderie. Whether I was producing or engineering or, or booking shows or performing alongside of them, collaborating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Copacabana, Havana, tropical locale. Mm -hmm. Tropicana is champagne that I can't pronounce. Mm -hmm. Sipping mimosas over breakfast at my favorite view. Butter and toast and proposing them too. Cause it's a beautiful life, like that 90s track. Let me rhyme a puffy bar so I can bring the 90s back. Swimming in women with my own condominiums. You can call me knowledge millionaire at the millennium. My dad ain't real life, but it's sounding real nice. Daydreaming on the daily, make you realize more money, more problems that don't even make sense. All about the Benjamins, I don't need to make friends. We did a lot of recording, a lot of shows, played out everywhere. We, <laughs> it was crazy. We, anywhere we were booked, we brought the whole crew, the whole label. <laughs> And it's hard to keep a lot of grown men focused, especially with not a lot of money coming in. You know, people start getting, uh, start getting anxious and they start getting unsatisfied. And it kind of got to the point where we were like, they felt like we were, I guess, had a grip on them or telling them what to do type thing. And I mean, we were trying to look out for them. It just, I thought that whole thing kind of just fell through our fingers, you know, at that point. We were, it was a good idea. And we had a lot of dope artists and had a lot of fun with them. At the end of the day, we, you know, as mixing business with pleasure whatever i'm not a businessman <laughs> chris ain't either so you know it's it kind of just slipped through our fingers so it was like basement falling out i start some bands bands fall out start a label label falls out all alone <laughs> it was liberating but it was also kind of sad and disappointing because i i'd spent 15 years trying my damnedest to start a label and and bring all my friends and colleagues along and trying to start a movement more so for this town and so a part of it I, I had to look in the mirror like what am I doing wrong you know am I really that hard to work with am I really an egomaniac <laughs> is it, am I just do not have enough money for it? Is, it is it a question of resources I mean I don't know you know is it them is it me um, and you're driving and performing, driving to a show and performing by yourself and all those people that were once there are gone, you know, it kind of forces you to look in the mirror like, shit, what am I doing wrong?
to be a fan of Chris's, you have to be really um, attentive and have you know a lot of time on your hands because there's a lot of material he's going to throw at you. And, um, and sometimes it's hard to keep up with as a fan. He has too many songs and he has to set it up uh, on a schedule to get them all um, released before he dies naturally of natural causes at 104. I think that might be Chris's problem. He's like, man, I'm sitting on 17,000 songs right now. And if I don't stick to this schedule, then I'm gonna die with like 4,000 songs unreleased. So that might be his issue. Yeah, he could live to be 104, and there's still like seven songs he didn't, they didn't get to release before he passed. Our location is just, nobody reaches us way over here. We're just like so way up far off the map that nobody gives us a listen. It's, it's a complex place too because you don't really have the audience here that appreciates what people like Chris or other cats out here are doing. And it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough world to, to try to survive in. Even though we got a lot of hatred people, because a lot of times you're in a small town, it's like crabs in a burrow. It's like you're trying to grow up, people's always trying to put you down because they know you, they know this on you, they know that on you. I kind of think with Chris, I think it's, I think that's what drives him most is being from a small town because you got so many doubters, but yet you got love for the town. You know what I'm saying? So that love is automatically going to produce passion. You know, how did you, how did somebody in Frankfort, Kentucky get their music into Los, into Los Angeles, California, or in, at the same time, in New York City and simultaneously in Atlanta, and how do you do that? How does how do people in Detroit hear about you if you're just a a small town kid? You know, regardless how big your dream is and how your work ethic, how do you get your tangible music into the right people's hands? In the old days, you, you could you could drive around in, in your car and drop off, you know, a 45 at a, a radio station. They they might play it, you know. But those days, or you could just pay them. <laughs> those days are gone. You can pretty much milk the cow dry, you know. You can only play at this bar so many times and this bar so many times. And keep giving the same music or different music to the same people. When you have a little budget and then you're also doing your normal life and trying to work and make money and raise kids and go to school and, and do all these normal things, how do you balance? becoming that full-time artist with a life of normalcy and a life of responsibility. In the old days, a label, you got signed to a label, they'd throw the money on you, you'd create your product, they'd sell it, they'd distribute it, they'd market it, they'd do the whole thing. That, that doesn't happen. They don't go out and harvest the artist. You know, there's not agents out here running around looking all over. That still happens to a degree, but as far as then taking that raw talent, going through the whole developmental process, that, that doesn't really happen. With the internet, it's a little bit different. You got better uh, percentages to, to do that and to kind of get the music over the fence. You can you can uh, give your product directly to the fans. You know, you're cutting out the middleman, which was the label. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's, a, it's an exciting time, a very exciting time. You know, because I remember back then, pre-internet, it was all about, yo, get signed, get signed, get signed. Now you don't even really need that. You know, if you're now we're talking about streaming Spotify, Apple Music, whatever the platform is, Facebook likes, the whole social media platform, views, you know, if, if you take that and you build those numbers organically, then the label's gonna look at it and say, Well, look what he's already done. Look what he's we we can work with this because he's done most of the work and that's where Chris is at. I mean he's he works so hard, man. He's he's, he's a worker. Social media or no social media, he had us out in the streets passing out flyers, putting them on windshields when we was 22. You know, had some raw little album we did, and you know, he's like, "Come on, let's go put out these flyers." <laughs> There's a football game. We'll go put out flyers in the on the cars or at Walmart or Kroger, just wherever. It was like. He didn't need social media back then to do what he wanted to do. He just did it. And he'd go to every parking lot. I don't know how many times I would go to a parking lot and know it would be a flyer and I can almost guarantee that it was Chris Ballinger promoting one of his shows. On the page I pour my rage and stage rides pour. I'm a mage with art who 
Amazing magician on stage with heart I played my part like a deranged angel that plays his heart For days I starved I dove in the cesspool head first and slayed the sharks With an ancient spark, I made my mark So much is said and done along the way I just keep holding on Never heard of my name until I murdered the game And I can tell it better than I can sell it I prefer to explain If you could walk a day in my shoes I'd hope you trade it back for your horse They say where's your team, why you ain't signed yet Get so high, get And uh, he was working out of a studio in Lexington. And they had heard me and brought me into the studio to work on a new album. And they were really uh, wanting to push me and sign me kind of a, in a development deal. Um, and we were already working. You know, it was in the progress. I hadn't actually signed the, um, the contract yet. But they were really building me up, you know, and, and kind of selling me a dream. But then on further investigation of my catalog, they were starting to look at more of my music and videos and they got confused they were like you know you got too much going on you're doing too much you're all over the place one minute you're like this you're southern rock rap and then the next minute you're midwest fast rap and you're a battle rapper and you're just all over the place we don't know how to market you we don't know what to do with you um and it was kind of discouraging because i can't help what i lo love to do I mean, I can pick a pace a little bit and do that, but I get bored or I, I, I want to try something else. I don't want to be limited. Um, and so basically they uh, revoked the contract. They no longer wanted to sign me. They were basically like, you are doing too much. We don't know how to market you. We can't develop somebody who's already developed and who's all over the place with this immense catalog. So instead, unless you can take it all down and start from scratch, and wear this and act like this and sound like this, we can't help you. That's difficult to do for labels. They're very, they have a tricky time saying, this person's like this, but they're also like that. They have a hard time doing that. And he's like many things. Uh, he's like eight, eight to 10 different things. So what are they gonna do with that? So it's just, you would be constraining that artist by, by doing that, by, by, by having them go out to LA, sign with a label, and have that experience and he he needs to have that kind of just versatility and, and variety at the same time that's what makes chris chris you know what i'm saying that like that's what that's what makes it madness you know what i mean that's what makes it madness and it's and man i wish i wish there was one thing i was passionate about in life as much as he is about music and you know, because it's, you know, his, his energy for the music is strong. You know, when I was growing up, there was, you heard about pot and you heard about alcohol and, you know, a little bit of this and that. And it's like, but over the past 20 years, the number of drugs, and prescription drugs and street drugs is just multiplied. Like in a, you know, um, in seems like Kentucky and a lot of these southeastern states were ground zero for the pill epidemic. You know, sometime in the early 2000s, a lot of people around these small towns in Kentucky uh, got addicted to pain pills, which inevitably led to a lot of heroin use and meth use. And, and over a few years, you know, what started is to seem just to be kind of an urban legend or just to be kind of. Uh, Something you heard about through the grapevine or uh, rumors and things eventually started affecting everybody. Show you life, y'all. Pray for me, return the favor for all those times I pray for you. Love is all we have to heal each other. Return the When it's coming and I'm gathering up the killer The fire's burning deep inside but I can't avoid the feelings I lost another friend, they ain't dead, they just changed I'll see you in the end when this life passed away Another girl broke my heart but it's probably just my karma Lost another job, had to buy money for mama Need to be the 
the one that saves you from the coming storm. Not afraid to say I love you, even though I'm torn. You know, and so I, when I tried to approach the Lay It Down song, it took me a long time to figure out the right angle because I was kind of scared to touch it because uh, I wanted to be sympathetic, but I also wanted to wake people up as well, you know, and maybe help. How can I do that effectively when I've never been hooked on drugs? I'm, I'm looking at it from a bird's eye view, you know, and part of me was struggling with the idea of what right do I even have to talk about them. I woke up, I had a show the night before, uh, just a regular old show at the local bar, late night. I woke up on a Sunday, uh, it's really early in the morning, you know, I hadn't even had a cup of coffee yet, you know, and uh, picked up the guitar and started um, uh, fiddling around with some, some notes and some chords and, and all of a sudden it hit me, it was just like a voice was like, alright, here's that song, here comes that song. Most of the people that I work with are um, singer-songwriters who come in here with either a guitar or a piano, and they've they've written their song start to finish. The, structurally, it doesn't need sort of any input from me. Um, it's really at that point my role is really just to be an engineer and mixer. And just uh, and it could be, you know, you could put. You could vary that snare pattern. It wouldn't have to be busy, but it would give it variation. Mm. The idea that he had to start with was was pretty basic and straightforward, but it had a lot of um, had a lot of emotion in it, and uh, and that's what I sort of really connected to. Um, but I but I felt like musically it needed to have a bit more variation to make it be more um, more interesting for you know three or four minutes. Is this, is this okay over here? Just yeah, yeah, this yeah. guy. Do you need? Um, you need light for your lyrics or anything like that? Or I, might, I might put them on that though. Okay. Or I could actually, if I, I can put in, pin them. Oh, uh, the music. Okay. Give me a bit of a level. Check, check. Hello. You hearing yourself? Yeah, sounds good. All right, good deal. And you used to have such a perfect plan Too much pain and bad circumstance No perfect man and no perfect girl Hard to understand an imperfect world The misery keeping me company ho <laughs> The misery keeping you company Hoping that something is coming that finally works Maybe I'll find you in church on a Sunday With someone that's not really making it worse Well listen man, while you're over there on the mic Do you want to have a go on the on the yeah, singing parts too? Yeah, All right. let's do it Good deal Oh. It needs it needs some um, a bit more musical arrangement basically, and uh, which is good because I really like doing that. <laughs> One, two, three. You can't see, you can't sell yourself quite like I do. You know you need some help, but that's on you. We have been down this dark road before That same old devil keeps knocking at your door What I did was I skipped over these lines here I remember a time not long ago Oh, I right? forgot about that, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, That didn't seem to be as needed as the other ones Yeah, I just want to have it just in case Yeah, yeah the interesting part of the process is finding the sweet spot between the ideas that I bring to it and and how it you know you don't want it to stray too too far away from his original idea because he's the artist. You, know. you ready? Yep. Here we go. The same old drugs took the spirit from my brothers. The same old drugs are the reason, my son. Lost his mother. Alright, cool. A little off time on that part, but that's okay. That's that's exactly what I sang right there. Okay. So you married down? Yeah. Alright. And maybe it, I'll just have a variation in the way I sing it a little bit, like maybe just like 
get into it more? Sure, vary it as much as you like, yeah. Okay. The people that love you so much have tried everything. Well, I like it so far. What do you reckon? Yeah, I like it. We're in the right track? I mean, my vocal, my singing vocals aren't mind blowing or nothing, but <clears throat> maybe you could send me a rough draft of that and oh, I yeah, could yeah. kind of like, okay, here's where I need to, uh huh, you know, extend that word or. Especially that'll go good with that rap, though. Yeah, right. That's my comfort zone. All right, okay, that's, um, that's all I need to know. You can't see a... You can't see yourself. Lord, I wish I had a gift to give you now. Today would be the day you decided to lay it down. The same old drugs took the spirit from my brother. My dad just called me one day. You know, <laughs> it was like, hey, you know, I'm your dad. You want to meet? I was like, all right. Let's do it. Coming from my dad's point of view, I mean, inside, he was probably nervous, you know, just scared, probably, you know, probably felt like a failure, you know. So it took him a while, but he eventually did it. And I've always been a forgiving person because I, I know that, you know, without forgiveness, you're limiting, you know, your reality and your, your connection with certain people. But through forgiveness, you can, it opens up all sorts of doors. It liberates both parties, and essentially there's something there, whether that's a friend or that's a family member or that's a stranger on the street, you know. Uh, so I, I brushed any um, resentment completely off my shoulders and hopped on a plane and went to Florida like it wasn't no thing and shook his hand like, hey, what's up? I never brought up any of the craziness or any of the – disappointment or anything like that i was just like all right let's see let's see what you got let's see let's see what we can do and i sang i got behind the mic he he plugged up his guitar and all his martial stacks and lit it up and we just made some music just for the hell of it just because we both wanted to <laughs> You know, it was like, um, it was, it was just a, a cool moment. I knew it was kind of a, on a, a personal historic moment for both of us while it was happening. And so, and you know, to know that it was freestyle and we were making it up as we went, um, made it even more surreal. It was kind of surreal. It's like you go 30 some odd years and you don't know, know this guy. And all of a sudden it's like a blink of an eye. I'm down in Florida where I've never been in some studio. I've never been. And I'm with the, the man that, you know, helped create me, you know, and he's playing guitar. Like I always heard he could. And here I am singing and it was just kind of surreal, like, wow, life, life just throws some strange curveballs sometimes if you let it, you know. <laughs> and you just kind of got to go with it sometimes. And just think if I never would if I would have just been pissed off and angry. And, like, when he called me, like, oh, you're my dad, so what? Click. You know, you would have never had that that moment. And life's short. Life's really damn short. And so I ain't trying to keep any door locked.
So when the time came for me to have my son, I, it was no thinking about it. It was like something I was, I loved. Um, it was like the most amazing thing, and still is to me. Like, um, and despite all the up and downs with me and my son and us button heads, uh, probably because we're both Tauruses and we've lived together for the past, you know, 15 years, but um, it's been the most amazing experience to just become a father at a young age and to to just um, have my son with me at all times, you know, to just raise him all by myself. You know, it's actually been an amazing experience. And uh, I never really, um, it was never really a question of, well, I need to do this better than my dad, or I didn't have a dad, so I can't do this, or nothing like that. I, I kind of embraced the, the whole thing and like ran with it, like, oh, this is awesome. You know, this is a, an amazing experience. And it changed me for the better. And, it, you know, it brought a lot of um, worry in my life, you know, because you become a parent, you just you just worry about so much, that, so, so much. It's scary, it's scary as hell. In a strange juxtaposition, it kind of, as I became a father, it kind of made me wonder, well, what would my life have been like if I would have had that one father, you know, that was doing the things that I do for my son, or just being there, and just, whether it's complimenting or motivating or just saying he's proud of you, or being there at my shows. You should know that hearts get broke, but over time they heal. Sometimes it's hard to separate the fake from real And it's better to be alone than play somebody's victim If you break up with your girl, you're allowed to miss her Remember the tallest trees grew from the smallest seeds Swallow your pride and don't be scared of apologies Only follow he with honesty Treat women like your sisters Don't be timid to fall in love in time Don't be scared to show emotion Because love's divine When your mind is made walls come down you can do anything you believe you can do you can build you a home you can leave this old town you can let it all go you can lay it all down sometimes you just got to sit there and be quiet yeah, yeah. and that's when a voice appears but only in silence I mean, part of it is sort of like your standard kind of, you know, Grammy, American Music Award kind of kind of thing, where you'd have, you know, best rock, best jazz, hip hop, you know, on and on and on. And then we've got other we've got other categories too, like um, performance categories for like best uh, best guitar, best drums, best whatever. And then we've got an industry side, best live venue, best sound man, best recording studio, things of that nature. So the public selects half the nominees, and then our panel selects the other half of the nominees. So like, if there are four people in hip-hop then two of them have been chosen by the public and two of them by panel so that way you get you get a mix of both and the winner is hybrid the rapper what's up I had a really amazing speech all lined up and on my way here I kind of forgot it so I'm gonna keep it simple I just want to thank everybody for welcoming me to the scene with open arms um, all the fans friends and family uh, I really appreciate being that I'm not exactly from Lexington everybody open the doors for me and let me um, you know be here but mainly I want to um, there was a friend of mine who for a long time was a supporter, like even when he was a little kid, he was a supporter of mine, and he was a really a, a beacon for my home city, which is Frankfurt. And uh, he passed away last night, and he was, um, it was a really untimely thing. And I just want to dedicate this to him, Austin Brownlee, because 
uh, so many people don't have the, the chance or the pedestal or the outlet like we do, but yet they still love music and appreciate it and shine light in their own manner. And I'd like to get, dedicate this to him. And, uh, and thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. it it's, it's a pure love for music because there's, no, there's really no money in it around here. Um, no, one's, no one's really making a living doing original music. It's, it's a struggle, but at the same time, it's a beautiful struggle. You know what I mean? Because it's endless. It's endless opportunities, you know, for you to get out there and just make a career on your own. You can do it all on your own. You know what I mean? Most musicians, I think, are doing it because they, they're, because they're, because they have to. <laughs> you know, because we're musicians and we we had to play, and we'd play if we were just sitting in our basements. You know, like filmmakers. Filmmakers are gonna make films. You know, and painters are gonna paint. I guess it's just like the artist in you, though, man. You just got to keep going. You got new stuff in your mind all the time. No matter what people say or don't say, you know, he's proven that he knows what he's doing. He he loves it 100 percent. So I think he's just, that's his way, that's his art. That's his way of showing through art who he really is. Maybe maybe it's the love. Maybe it's the appreciation. Maybe uh, maybe it's, it's just the heart to, to stick with it, I think, is what's, uh, I think that's what, what probably drives Chris, man. He's just got that that heart, that perseverance, maybe on another level, but I can't, I can't fathom it. It's beyond that the case. I don't even know if it's a word for the dry that, that you know, he got with this you know what I'm saying? i don't even know what, what is it what can you say madness. madness it's like a mad scientist in the lab i've always told him i said man you don't give up keep fighting and here we are almost 20 years later and i can't even turn on facebook without seeing chris ballinger still pushing that music he wants people to hear he wants people to know that's what it takes and, and he's still doing it, and he hadn't missed a beat, and I'm proud of him for that, man. Like, don't let nobody slow you down or let somebody's opinion or remark stop you, whether it's your, me or any of the homies. Like, don't just do your thing, man. That's what, that's what makes you you. So I'm proud of him. Pretty much the one thing that stuck to me that Hybrid has always said that pretty much if, you know, your kids see you trying to live up your dream, that – you're leading by example that they will push to live up their dream and how can we as artists and trying to live the, our own dream basically expect them to live up to their own dream if we're not pushing ours i feel like i've poured my life on lines of paper on so many stages through so many songs there came a time in my life when I stopped looking at my dream of making it in music objectively as some prize or trophy to be set on the shelf, but rather embraced the fact that the dream itself was a part of me in real time and I was living it right now. I took a lot of criticism, but that's all a part of the road less travel. What was your obsession? Music was mine. Writing was mine, and there was a method. No looking back, my past ways. Now I know the true meaning of the last days. Giving in my past when I confess of my flaws. Attraction comes next like a universal law. In awe of an awesome sight, I pause. Effect of my cause, the thing that I saw. Such a beautiful thing that I saw. On a Sunday with someone that's not really making it worse.
goals I made, trying to motivate Hold my faith with the hands of God Never coming down with the cloud And I'm standing on no landing pad I'm standing strong Feeling in my stomach when I run into the end zone You can thank me later for not telling him anything bad about you <laughs> Generation could do it, I'ma prove it to myself Get on the stage with a mic and lose Dreaming of changing the game, got me talking in my sleep I just wanted the fans to give me dap when they see me walking down the street Damn, I hustle my grind, my struggle for respect But my check was minimum wage last time I checked I'm trying to tell them who I am with a nice set I'm trying to tell them who I am with a bike check My life has been like an ongoing documentary I lost so many friends but looking at my enemies I feel like a ghost lost inside my papal But he just, he gets this slow burn about it And before you know he's kind of pulled you into this this whole, you know, hybrid vortex thing. Don't tell him I said that, his head will blow up and he'll be an asshole. <laughs> Better than 90% of the industry, why in the world am I underground? Selling imperative clues, telling my narrative blues Barely could carry a tune, living in the dark side Till my daring escape from the moon, zoom! Never could've ever thought a beat is good Especially when we was growing up We said when we's old enough, we'd leave that neighborhood There's a method to my madness, they think I'm kinda crazy They say I'm obsessed, well I guess I have been late Underdog from a small town, I got it rough A thousand songs in my brain, it's not enough Try to come up with little resources, can't do it, collabs for free plus choruses. Where when they gonna get up and fight, keeping me up in the middle of nights. Play on my fiddle, be little my plight, little by little, so little I fight. Since high school, been doing my rules, the moment that back at that giving to y'all, I'd be honored to do it. I came and I saw. Like I unloaded my strife when I uploaded my life. But what do you do when you know that it's tight? You know. Uh. Hope that. Uh. Hope that. Yeah. Hope Take it to the movie, baby So alone, I've been going crazy We met before through some close friends Now open up the door and we can toast again Right? Huh? For real? You call me? I, I must have missed it